Alright, so, um, this is communication studies, as you know, for six form, and I'm going to start it in a very, how to say, just from the top and then go straight down. I won't mix it up or anything, so I'm going to be really following the syllabus here, I'm starting at module one and just going straight down, um, chapter by chapter. I'm going to tr try to cover a chapter every class. And I will be posting these slides to where I'm supposed to. I'm not exactly sure as yet, but in the coming weeks I'll be able to start that out. Um, um, anything else? Oh yes, and the recording will also be there, because I'll try to do it every time. Alright, so I'm going to begin. Alright, so like I said, this is module 1, chapter 1. And the learning objectives for today will be to define the important terms related to communication and understanding also identify the levels of understanding well because there are different levels of understanding and also to understand the function modes and purpose of reading and writing and lastly to recognize the importance of effective effective reading and listening give me one second Right. So, what is communication? You're doing communication studies, so that is one of the first questions you will think to ask yourself. And to answer that, I have two definitions here. One is really concise, but the other one is really easy to remember. Communication is simply the act of transferring information from one place, person, or group to another. All communication involves at least one sender, a message, and a recipient. But for ease of, on your memory I suppose, communication is the process of transferring information from one entity to another. Um, I think I have some interactive things later on in this, but I don't know how I'm going to get through that. But I'll just go with the flow. So, there are six levels of understanding. Literal, imperative, analysis, application, synthesis, and evaluation. Right, literal understanding. Literal understanding is when we understand something literally. Uh, we understand what something is, or what does it, or what it means. Sorry. So we ask questions like, what it is, what it, what does it mean? Um, I think I have an example for this as well. Yes. So I want you to read the extract below. I'm just going to give you a few seconds. It's not really long. It's just literally three sentences. But what is your literal understanding of the extract below? It says his shadow shouts on a nightmare screen. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. Now when you hear that, there's certain words in there that will give you the literal understanding of what it is. Um, for example, uh, it says, His wings are clipped and his feet are tied. It also said he opens his throat to sing. Based on the fact that you know when you, you relate wings to um, a bird some type of bird so then that would give you an idea that this is saying uh, mm -hmm. or speaking about a bird that is maybe injured or something like that so that's a literal understanding what the words mean to you based on prior knowledge all right so that's what we speak we're talking about when we say a literal understanding now if you go on now to interpretive understanding um Interpretive understanding is after we sorry after we finish the literal then we want to interpret it and this is where we take things a step further and we infer a meaning. To do this we ask questions like who, why, where, when and how. Now if we take this small extract before you would see that there's not enough information for us to ask who, uh, why, where, when or even how. Maybe we can ask a little bit about how because we know that is a bird and the wings were clipped and its feet were and its feet were tied. But I don't yeah, I, okay. So an example now for the interpretive understanding is the next time you are watching a movie or reading a book and you ask yourself any of the five questions, you're engaged in the interpretive understanding. And I'll give you an example. Let's say something happened in the movie and you didn't quite catch it, so you ask yourself, how did that happen or like 
let's say he jumped from a really tall building and survived, you'd say how? And that's when you're invoking that interpretive understanding. Or you would be like, when did that happen? And you would have to think back in your head and remember like, what happened before something else happened in the movie and then you will be able to say oh you interpret it and you was like ah it had to happen when the couple meet each other that's when they fall in love let's say so things like that would constitute as interpret interpretive mm -hmm. understanding so um analyzing or analysis no the i think this is the third one is the process of analyze sorry the process of analyzing involves a detailed breakdown an examination to understand what is going on or how something works and the example I'm using here is diagnosing a patient now let's say your friend just has a high fever it would be presumptuous of you to say oh you have a cold or the flu maybe as the flu is going around that would be your interpretive understanding because you know the flu is going around you're saying hi you got a high fever you probably have the flu but that does not necessarily mean that the person does have the flu so this is where you go to a higher level of understanding which is to analyze. Now let's say the symptoms of a flu are um, a high fever, a sore throat and maybe a headache. If now your friend shows all three of these symptoms then you can get definitively say okay you have the flu. But let's say they just have a high fever because they were running around in the sun all day and they are worn out, right? So that's analysis for you. Next we go on to application and synthesis and the reason I put both of these together is because they overlap And when I say they overlap, I mean I'm going to show you what is the difference between them because sometimes it can be confusing So after analyzing and understanding its makeup, you are then capable of applying that understanding in a way that allows you to change And this is synthesizing Additionally, if one were to use the same knowledge slash understanding and apply it to a different situation or in a different form, this is application. And now I ask you to pay, move your attention to this extract here. And um, I'm going to read it for you again. And I want you to think about how you were able to apply this and how you were able to synthesize it before I say anything. So, humans give flowers and candy when wooing a lady, pigeons gives rock, gives that's what give rocks, sorry. Not just any rocks though. Male gento penguins search through piles of pebbles to find the smoothest, most perfect ones. When a penguin has selected his pebble, he presents it to his intended companion. As she approves, she puts the stone in her nest and the two are well on their way to becoming mummy and daddy birds. Pebbles are so important to the penguins that males often fight over the prettiest selections. Now, a way to apply this and what application really means in the truest sense of the word is that when you take this extra or this information you just learned because like I mentioned before <laughs> when I wasn't sharing my screen um, when I was doing this out I was actually learning this because I didn't know that smooth rocks were so important to penguins. so now that I've gained this new knowledge or this new understanding I've literally understand, understood what it means. Basically, it means that they get rocks and this is a part of their mating experience. Right? Or how the female selects the male, etc. So that's my literal understanding. And then my interpretive understanding would have been also a part of what I said just now because I interpreted to understand. Even though they didn't say that this is the means by which they mate or choose a mate. and then analysis so basically everything i just do to tell you this was me analyzing breaking it down step by step so first i realized about the rocks and then that it must be a smooth rock and it must present it to the female and the female must approve and then on we go so now that i've done all that i can apply this to something else and when i say apply it to something else i mean i can take this information that i have learned about pigling and let's say later in school I'm doing an assignment and I decide to write these facts that I learned in that essay or what have you then I have applied the information however or on the other hand synthesis now is when we take this information and it is in words I read it let's say I put it into a song 
so let's say I'm a rapper or something and I learn about this and I rap and I use something about pigments and rocks in a bar in my song then that would be synthesis because I synthesize and change the information from reading it words into a song um, another way to synthesize would be in a video uh, I really not mm, yeah I can yeah if I synthesize the same information I've learned and put it into a visual context then that's also synthesizing Alright, moving on smartly. So, the final level of understanding is the evaluation of the knowledge acquired, and at this stage, you're able to make your own conclusions about the knowledge you have gained and should be able to give insight on the information. So, this is the final level, and this is when you're able to evaluate it now, is when you have, or when communication studies say that you have fully understood what it is and basically my way of telling you about the story with the extract with the pigeon sorry pig wings um was me doing an evaluation giving insight on the information and even what i'm doing right now by teaching you is part partially evaluation after i learned the information myself and then i am also i'm synthesizing it changing it in a way that will help you to understand and so on and so forth so Moving on away from the, or now we've finished with the levels of understanding, I want to move on to the functions of language and writing. Uh, also have one, two, three, five, five functions, the reflective function, the expressive function, the communication function, the ritual function, and the identifying function. Now, do I have them all separate? No, I do not. Okay, so this is where it was hard for me to create slides because I didn't want to put too much information on them or bombard you with random just a lot of words and a lot of words so here I will try to simply explain them to you um, you'll be able to see these slides and the recording as well and be able to write your own notes if anything so when I'm gonna start from yeah I'm starting from start. so the reflective function just give me one second I'm answering this message really quickly. This is pretty important. All right. Sorry about that. So the reflective function. Um, when we think reflective function, you should start thinking this is when. Well, literally thinking, this is when language is used to think or to create ideas. So when you reflect, you are thinking and also creating ideas. So that's the way to think about it. Think about what you do when you reflect and also remember that the reflection function is when language is used to think or to create ideas. Now the expressive function is when language is used to express emotions. When you think expressive, think expression. Alright, so... An example of this is literally a sentence saying, I am really sad, you're expressing your emotions. And I should give an example for the reflective one as well. Uh, if I said to you, let's go and buy these snacks in bulk and then sell them. I have reflected on it, I'm like, let's, I'm thinking about making some money, if we buy them in bulk and then we sell them, in singles or what have you make money and I just that I just performed that reflective function and I use my language to express it as well um, thirdly the communication function obviously this one is self-explanatory when language is used is when language is used to send ideas um, or thoughts and translate it into our language so literally what I'm doing to you right now is part of the communication function and the ritual function um, this one is simple as well. This is when language is used to pray. So once you're praying, you're actively participating in that ritual function. Um, and lastly, the identifying function. Um, this is when language is used to identify an individual's culture or social background. This one is like the most like, random one in my opinion. Like, so when you see the words, you might not be able to 
remember so this is going to have to pay attention to but this is when language is used and repeat it again when language is used to identify an, an individual's culture or social background hmm. okay um there's something i'm looking at my notes and there's something i forgot to say with these ones so i had started off by putting it in but then i didn't finish so for later understanding, I say the questions you would ask, which is, what is it, what does it mean? And then for the imperative, I say you ask questions like, who, why, where, when, and how? But I stop there. So for the interpretive, this is when we describe, explain, classify, express, recognize, those type of words is what we're using when we think interpretive. For the analysis, we're thinking compare, mm -hmm. contrast, experiment. Those are the type of words they want to associate with analysis. And for application and synthesis, for application, let me start with for application. Um, think, apply, or translate, demonstrate. Those words. Um, and then for synthesis, sorry think, um, design, organize, formulate, change even, and then for evaluation, think, judge, appraise, um, assess. Okay, just need to add that in there, I missed that in my notes. Okay, so, moving smartly along, I think we're here. Uh, another two functions, these ones are strange, so I, I add to, added something on the slides for them. So the last two functions of language and writing are the phatic, phatic language. And I have an example here, how is it going, what's up, are yours sincerely? Um, this is, especially the yours sincerely, but this is when, um, how do I explain it, let's say, just like sometimes it's just like saying things that does not don't necessarily need an answer so if i say to you if i say at the end of something you're sincere you do not have necessarily have to reply to that or i might say you know like how guys greet each other and be like what's up we don't exactly mean what's up in the sense of uh yeah um the sky or yeah, I'm good. We mean what's up like is like a shout, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have to replay. Stuff like that. Um How is it going as well? You don't really sometimes you don't really need like necessary I mean you know usually you need a replay for it, but think more things that necessarily you don't need a replay. So think of the way that you would write emails or and you would say you're sincerely at the end, like I mentioned before, or just you walked up between people, but when you don't necessarily mean to know was up but because of how language has changed over the years as well too in terms of because at one point what's up didn't w mean how are you doing it, it, it didn't translate like that if you say what's up somebody will be confused right um i want to move on yeah so metalinguistic language is the last function and let me use metalinguistic language, we comment on the language itself. This function is the use of language to discuss or describe itself. So, the best example, and one of the only ones out there, there, there are probably a few more there, is the preface of a book. So, you know that in the preface is almost like a summary, or it tells you about what the book entails, and you would read a preface and decide if you actually want to read that book. That is metalinguistic language. Let me talk about language either that is you're going to read if you continue reading or sometimes um what is that example if we talk about somebody's language to another friend say well i didn't like what he was saying we both know what happened but and then we're talking about what happened that is actually metalinguistic language it's really strange but whenever you think about it think about the preface of a book because that is the best example um, let me check. Am I good on time? Yes, I am. Okay. So, the purpose of writing and its genres. Obviously, very, very simple, very obvious. Purposes of writing is to inform, to entertain, to persuade, 
and the genres are narrative, descriptive, expository, argumentative, or persuasive. This, this genre, this part, is very, very important, and I think I'm actually going to have to do a chapter or a whole hour session on the different genres, and we're eventually going to learn the difference between them, and actually how to write them, alright? But I won't go in too in depth right now, alright? So, reading and listening. Efferent reading, this is reading to gain understanding or information. So this is the reading you do when you're studying for school and such and such like. And then we have aesthetic reading, which is reading for more casual purposes or for pleasure. Uh, for example, when I was younger, I would read a lot of Harley Drew and Nancy. Or not, no, I say Harley Drew, wow. Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys, right? I'd read a lot of that, and that is aesthetic reading. And then, obviously, any reading you do for school is effort reading. So moving on smartly, why we listen? We listen to obtain information, to understand, for enjoyment, and also to learn. Now, these are things that we, we know, and, and that's why I find a lot about um, communication studies as well. There's a lot of things that we know, it's just we don't think about them that deeply. So if I ask you randomly why we listen, sometimes you may not be able to say these four things. You might only say one or two. But when you hear it, you're like, yeah, of course that is it. That is why. Right. So you'll find that a lot in communication studies. Alright, so this is probably one of the most important parts of today's um, session, I want to call it. And that's the barriers to listening. This comes up a lot. So the context. And when I say context, I mean the places or situation. And I'll try to give you an example here. Um, but, oh, perfect example. Today, I'm teaching on a new platform. I'm not very accustomed to it. And I only trail run it probably once or twice. And I still wasn't entirely sure what I was doing. So, that would be a barrier to listening. The context. Literally, this online school. If I was doing this in person, I couldn't forget to share my screen because it would have been... Or I would have made a mistake when I shared it because... It would have been on a whiteboard or a chalkboard or what have you. Alright, maybe I would have forgot my markers, but even then, it would not have been as bad. So, when you think context, think places and situations that would hinder listening. Like even a noisy place, when you're trying to hear what somebody's saying, that is the context and that is a barrier to communication. Um, we also have technology. Um, the barriers here is that it's less interpersonal. And again, making the example of online school. Um, some people like to see body language, and I guess for that I will have to show on my camera or what have you. But some people, they, they listen better when they can see your body language. And because of the use of technology, is less interpersonal. Or have you ever been misunderstood when you send a text message and somebody say, like, they felt bad or they thought it was offensive. But you, didn't, you, mean, you, mean, you meant it as a joke, right? And I guess that's why emojis, emojis are, that's what, sorry, emojis are there for. But that um, is all, it's a barrier to communication because even if you're saying like apolo apologizing to someone over text, they cannot necessarily feel empathy through words on a screen, right? Or you're how sorry you are, or what have you. So yeah, that is a barrier to communication. Um, next barrier is prejudice. So. Biases, yeah, the race, gender, and ethnicity. So we do have these. Sometimes they're subconscious, and sometimes they're very blatant. However, some people do have these, and they'd have um, a bias against a different race. For example, uh, I don't want me one that will offend anyone, so I'm actually going to leave that out. And then gender. Sometimes uh, we know we have the feminists and stuff like that. They might have some men that wouldn't take the advice from a woman because hey she's a woman and I won't take advice from her so that's a barrier to listening or to communication because he's not going to take advice from a woman because he's too much man and ethnicity as well there are also prejudice we have in terms of ethnicity um, like persons who are mixed and stuff like that they may not have or if you're talking about topics such as um, Black lives matter, and then there's a person who's mixed, who has a white mother and a white father, their voice, if they say anything, it will not be heard as much as if it has coming from someone who was actually black. So those 
uh, examples and ways of how prejudice can actually be a barrier to listening. Um, even though what the person might, might uh, have said is really true and has a lot of weight in the conversation, it still would be undermined. Alright, so last barrier is the emotional. So negative emotions mostly of course, sometimes positive emotions as well, but I'll get there. Um, fear, depression and stress. So we obviously know that if we're in fear, we're less likely to have a rational conversation with someone. Um, if you're scared of the dark and you just hear something rustling in the bush, you don't want to talk about the school where you have to do it. So it really friend you is just walking. You're not going to hear anything about that. You're going to be more focused on the noise you just hear in the bushes. Um, depression and stress, I guess you can imagine as well how those can be barriers to listening. And um, the cat that was using said negative emotions, but positive emotions can be barriers as well. Um, have you been ever so happy that, you know, like, or joyous? that you may miss what the person was saying because like say say someone tell you good news or you want do you want to hear the good news or the bad news first and they tell you the good news and it's really good news you're happy you're super excited you're less likely to listen to the bad news after because you're still on that high from the good news so i think positive emotions depending on the context can also be barriers to listening all right so so what do I do to be a good listener? We've been talking about the buyers, all different types of listening and understanding and all of this. But here's the question you're probably thinking. What do I have to do to be a good listener? And to do that, I have six points here. Be aware of and terminate any buyers to listening. You just learn what those buyers are. So if it's really noisy in your background, I suggest you go to a different room and you've eliminated that barrier. Um, make yourself aware of the context and carry yourself appropriately. Now, for example, um, I've heard it told, said to me many times and I've had to say, say it many times as well. When we're on the online platform, it's good to, you know, turn off your mic and stuff like that. And that's being aware of the context. You understand that because if your mic is on, it, there's going to be that background noise and that really nasty echo and stuff like that. So you have made yourself aware of the context and you carry yourself appropriately and mute your mic. Um, paying attention to body language again you can't do that here on online school but it does help it does help paying attention to body language can let you know sometimes if a person is aggressive or if they're trying to emphasize a point you won't be able to see when I'm trying to emphasize guys really listen to me now because this comes because this comes a lot you're not going to see me doing that I'm going to try to um, really make you aware when this is a very important piece this is not just extra information so really listen now I'm gonna have to say for you to get it but sometimes you can tell those things with body language um where was it right to try to identify the purpose and the genres that the person is, that the person is using so again I very briefly went through it because I will be going through it later on but the genres were like narrative and argumentative and stuff like that and we also went through what the different purposes of um, reading and even listening are and I think it was to inform and the other ones so when you, when you identify what those are then you make yourself a better listener because you can kind of guess what's coming and respond appropriately uh, second to last try not to interrupt unless it is very important no it would have been very important to interrupt me and say hey you're not sharing your screen and I don't know why I keep going back to this but it's funny so that would have been a situation to interrupt but other than that uh, when you interrupt someone you can break their flow they can forget something that they were going to say that might have been important to the conversation so unless it's necessary you try not to interrupt that also makes you a good listener lastly if you have done these things well then you're fully equipped to give an effective response because listening or communication is all about again the sender the message and the receiver but continue that cycle the receiver has to understand the message and then evaluate it all the other steps would have said to say something back to the person that makes sense and is in line with what they were saying but actually to be conversation all right and you have made it to the end of my i want to call it a lecture 